Deep Sea Podcast Pressurized, a short, punchy version of our full-length shows. So if you want to get right to the scientific point, this is the place to be. If you really enjoy the topic and you think, I'd like to know more, just match the episode number and you'll be able to find the full-length episode in our feed. And now, to get right to the point. In order for me to understand the complexities of genetics, I kind of understand it as a tool and the questions that it helps me answer, but I have no idea how to do it and of the wider potential, of the wider things that can be learned. I'm no use at all, so Heather, as an expert, can help me. And we are joined by newly minted, brand new. She's been on the show before, but she's different now. She's changed. Dr. Johanna Weston, who's recently completed her Viva. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. I know. I feel like a fresh baby scientist now. <laughs> We've gushed a little bit before because we're, we're immensely proud of you on the team. What's your current species count? How many new species have you described? Officially, it's four, but one of them is still impressed, so it's still secret. Oh, a secret species. There's a genus in there as well, isn't there? Because pe people go their whole career without naming a genus. I know, and it happened to be one of my first ones. So maybe I just started off too big. And so it's all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> what is the process of describing a new species? How do we go about doing that? Ooh, that's a really good question. I mean, it's kind of like, how do you birth a child? Because in a way, like a new species is like your science child, and you feel very responsible for it. And there's a lot of pressure associated to you know, name it correctly and do it justice and bringing it into the world. And it carries your name forever as well. So everyone will know it's your fault. It does. There's a few kind of key steps. So one, you've got to have some specimens in front of you. You've got to do the work to decide like, oh, it has not been described before. And the work that you do could be visually, it looks different than other ones that are described. Genetically, it's different. So you've got to determine its differentness or its uniqueness. And then you've got to capture that uniqueness into a manuscript. And so that's collecting data on how it looks. You make really beautiful scientific drawings, which when I had started getting into it, you gave me great advice, Tom. You said scientific illustrations are like scientific caricatures. So you're not giving it a like for like look, but you as the scientist illustrator are trying to capture the essence and the key features for the next person, generations that'll start looking at it. Then you write everything up, send it to a journal, go through the peer review process. But once it's published, then you can actually talk about the name that you've given that species. There's weird secretism to the name, isn't there? You, you cannot use that name until it's fully published and, and you'll validate the name if you use it too early. Exactly. Which I think the purpose behind that, so it's this international rules stands for international I-Z-U-N. Even the thing itself just refers to itself as the code. And it's this enormous document. It's available online. I'll include it in the links. And it's this enormous document. And it reads like a legal document. It's the internationally agreed upon criteria for naming a new species. And it doesn't feel scientific. It feels legal. The whole thing to me felt a lot like a patent. So, so filing a patent, filing mm, something yes. new, you've got to identify what's already there, what's already been done, so similar patents. You've got to really specifically point out the things that make your design different from all the others and what you're essentially protecting, what is the thing that makes it different. And you have to describe that in enough detail so that another person can see that. It's not enough to say I'm the expert and I say it's so. You have to give other people reading enough to see the difference as well, and essentially train people to spot your new species. And I think the big difference comes, you have to place it within the tree of life. So that's that's the biological part. That's the, the separate part, which I've actually found really difficult. And that's sort of where, where genetics certainly comes in, because it can be quite separate from describing a new species. Quite often you can say this, this and this is different from this, this and this. So it is a new species. But when you come to actually place that in a genus and place that within the tree of life, it's a whole separate job. Yeah. So some species are really easy to place into the tree of life. Oh, it fits really nicely here. And there's other ones that it looks like it would fit here. But actually, the DNA helps give us another set of data that suggests it might be placed somewhere different, which that's how my new genus, Civifractura, came about. 
that this new species looked like it should fit into this genus called Tectobaleopsis, except for one little character, which consulting with other experts in the field, we were struggling to decide how to best describe this character. So actually, it's first palm, so kind of like how it would grab food, the shape of it. And then genetics gave us a window into placing it in a different part within the family and a part that hadn't been named yet. So we were faced with maybe two conflicting sets of information. So how it looked and what the genetics were kind of telling us. And so we decided to create a new genus, knowing that maybe morphology didn't give us the full picture, or our eyes just couldn't capture that difference. It's really interesting to think of placing things, almost like if you're building a jigsaw. Because when you when you build a jigsaw, you have both the shape of the jigsaw piece, and you have what's on the jigsaw piece. So you have like the color or the pattern, whatever. And it's easier to place something when more of the jigsaw around that has been completed. So sometimes it's really easy to match up a piece because the shape and the color matches perfectly. Whereas sometimes if you think of maybe the shape being the morphology and the color being the genetics, sometimes maybe one is enough to give you an idea of where it should be and you need the second to help you along. And then sometimes if you're building a part of the jigsaw that's nowhere near anything that's been done before, even having both those pieces of information, it's still not entirely clear exactly where it should sit, which is why sometimes species get renamed either at species level or genus level or sometimes even higher, like groups can move around the more that we start to build up um, the picture from all the jigsaw pieces. That's an amazing analogy. I think it's important to be able to collect both sets of information. The more information you can get, maybe it doesn't help you place that piece that day. Yeah, you can do the bare minimum to create a new species, or you can be forward looking and help scientists in hundreds of years time to better place it. You can give as as much corners to your piece as you possibly can. And they're, they're two totally different skills as well. So I have absolutely no skills in terms of identifying morphology that's useful for taxonomic description, whereas both of you have. And then the flip side of that is that I have the sort of genetic skills to look at that, whereas like Tom was saying earlier on, that's not something that he has the expertise in. So the work that Joanna has been doing has been really pooling both of those sets of skills together, which is sort of how the field has been going. And do you feel that, that that's where the field's going to continue to move is, is using both of these skills and sort of overlapping them? Yeah, so I feel like I've maybe Venn diagramming you two in your work and finding that like middle ground. So you, you can say it. You can say that you can do everything each of us can do individually. You can say you're yeah. better than us. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I can do everything <laughs> and not as good. Oh, uh, don't pack that is all. definitely not true. <laughs> I think that's where fields are going. And I think that's where Hadal science, deep sea science, is going and should continue to go. I think it's really important to be able to see and understand what you're looking at and then knowing what extra data you can collect to help see that bigger picture. And I think since these samples, they're so hard to collect, like we should squeeze as much information out of them as we can. Traditionally, there's a bit of conflict between these these two arms. And I know a lot of traditional sort of morphological taxonomists are wary or skeptical of genetics. But I've always, just like you say, basically, I've always felt that they're complementary tools. And, you know, you get convergent evolution, you get things that look really similar, but they've come from totally different directions. I see genetics as, you know, along with CT scanning, along with microscopy, and all the all the new methods that are available to us now that say Linnaeus and the founders of taxonomy didn't have access to, I, I see it as another tool to allow us to explore these species and where they lie. Do you, you feel this is a, a team effort? This is a harmony? They're just not individually giving us a full picture. And I think for me, being the on the genetic side of it, I find that the morphology, especially things that have been described in the past that we're now trying to backstamp some genetic data onto, the morphology is like the hypothesis. You know, you're saying, according to the morphology and the investigations I have done, I believe this 
is close related to this other species and then the genetics is a way of of one layer of testing it and either the genetics can say yeah i totally agree with that in which case that's cool we've proved the hypothesis that these two species are, are linked together or sometimes the genetics will say actually maybe not but that's not to say the morphology is wrong it's just to say that we're not sure so maybe we need to do more investigations um using a variety of different tools just having one sequence isn't going to tell you anything so you've got to build up to a hundred sequences from a hundred different species or something like that in order to get enough information to leverage the information that you can gain from genetics. So when we talk about sequencing a species, like this is where I'll hand something to one of you two and just be like, do your magic and tell me what it says. So what is what is the physical process? What is the method? So you hand off your fish tissue or an amphipods, you hand over an amphipod, and we're going to take that and with amphipods, chop off their head because that's a good place to get they have a meaty good face. tissue from. They have a yeah, meaty face. very meaty face. So we'll basically digest that to break open the cells and do a bunch of like different sort of washing procedures so that you just have the DNA and you wash away everything else. So you're washing away proteins, cell walls or cell membranes, like all of those bits. And you're just left with your DNA. Panning for DNA gold. Basically. Mm -hmm. So now that you've got your gold of DNA, species IDs mostly do like what's called DNA barcoding. We're just looking at at one little, little, little bit. So about 600 base pairs. So that's like 600 letters in the code, essentially. Yeah. So if you think of the whole genome as like an encyclopedia, if you were to compare an entire encyclopedia to a different encyclopedia, you would be there all day because there's too much information. So what you want to do is you want to look in one specific volume in one specific chapter, and you're going to read one sentence and then compare how those sentences are different across encyclopedias. And, and based on your knowledge and understanding, you've got a bit of a feel for where is the best place to look to see the difference. You're not diving right into the middle. You're looking for like the copyright page or the publishing date and things like that. Things that are most different between the different dictionaries. Yes. And ones where we've looked before. So that's really useful is that we make good use of data banking. So anytime you sequence something and you want to publish the sequence or work that you've done with the sequence. So I haven't described any species. So so like I use the sequences for looking at how different populations connect. But even then, if you want to use that information, you have to publish it online. So you publish it in a data bank. Once it's published, that becomes available for everyone else to use. So it's a really good resource. So then we don't necessarily have to buy all these encyclopedias. We have one that we've looked at, but we can just go online and say, I want to see what this one looks like and what that one looks like. And then we can just download all that information um, and then we can visually look at it or we can do analysis and look at it and then we can see how all those pieces all fit together like um joanna was saying that sometimes you need to preemptively do that work so you might have a species that doesn't have any other like it doesn't have any sequences in the database that looks like what you want it's that piece floating by itself yeah you have to keep adding and then over time so even within the last so five to ten years the number of sequences available for deep sea amphipods has grown really quite a lot because everyone started doing it for us it's it's usually samples that we've gathered from recent cruises but also places like natural history museums they'll have older samples maybe not so much for amphipods but certainly things like fishes and depending on how they've been stored we can even take some tissue sample from those and, and we can sort of go almost like back in time and start making barcodes for things that we've had for ages but we just didn't know that we could do that or the technology at the time wasn't there for us to do that so we can sort of reach out in a bunch of different ways to start building this resource that yeah becomes public data so anyone at home if you want to look at some sequences just because you want to you can do that <laughs> browse through them uh, yeah of course when we've got our little dna nugget from the specimen itself from the sample you do something called amplification yeah so it's called PCR amplification or polymerase chain reaction. If we're in our encyclopedia, we know exactly the part that we want to get. We know that there's a few words before and after that sentence that we're trying to grab. So we make what are called primers to basically find those sets of words and then make millions and millions of copies of that sentence. 
and that that's quite a biological process isn't it you you're using the the enzymes and the the natural processes that dna replicates with and even the things that cut and sort dna you're sort of incubating it you're like fermenting your dna and growing it yeah you're growing your own little strand of dna i mean this is used throughout science like now it's in the general lexicon of you've got your pcr covid test and so what they're doing with that is getting a little swab of your tissue to see if you've got this bit of covid in you or not when you've got your your big bundle of dna what happens then how do you sort of read that or interpret it so then you send it off to a sequencer basically the sequencer then translate it into getting your combination of t g c and a's and so then you've got your sequence to work with once you have your sequence you can compare it to see if it has a match with any similar organisms. And then you can grab a bunch of sequences and build a tree to see how closely related your new set of sequences are to known ones. That's computationally really heavy, isn't it? You guys get to play with supercomputers. Yeah, it depends how many species you want to look at, how many individuals. So we talk about barcoding as sort of amplifying up a sentence and we want to know what that is but sometimes one sentence maybe doesn't give us enough information or it's maybe not quite showing us what we thought it would be so the best way to be using a sentence a barcode is to look at multiple ones so maybe we say we want to take a sentence from chapter one one from chapter three and one from chapter eight and then we can compare all of them so when you start adding all of these data sets together it can become quite computationally heavy and there is a whole bunch of maths that i cannot explain that uses the information in it and it, it sort of decides which it thinks which ones are more closely related based on the a g c's and t's but then it, it's not necessarily a strict match it's not a case of it will pull apart a perfect this is close related to this and this one is really far away it's still an estimate so it will say i think based on the information you've given me, this is the best relationships. And you can perform analysis on that to say, okay, well, how confident are you that that's the correct configuration of it? And sometimes we can get really high scores. We can have pretty much 100% confidence. We can say A is most closely related to B and C is definitely further away. And then other times you can have maybe A is probably closely related to B. And then sometimes you can have really, really terrible scores which essentially just means that the information is insufficient. Because it all sorts of floats in this hypothetical space, isn't it? It's all about relationships. It's all just relevant to each other. There's no absolute scale, really. And that can change depending on which barcode you're using as well. When we were working together, I remember thinking that you had a research assistant that you were horrible to and kept making work weekends and late nights because you kept talking oh, about Maxwell. like, I'll give the data to Maxwell. It'll be done by tomorrow. And it turns out Maxwell was your supercomputer. <laughs> Yes. Who's it named after again? James Clark Maxwell, who was a Scottish theoretical physicist. In his image, he's been doing all of our analysis over weekends and Christmas and everything else for us. His brain in a jar that you've been pumping data into. Absolutely. Going back to like naming or describing a species and using these different tools. So we're comparing how one thing looks to the other. And there's a little bit of judgment that has to go on. But then also in genetics, there's a judgment of, is this tree giving me the best estimate? And then when you actually go to describe a species, putting a whole name and making it a fundamental unit. And I think that is an exciting and scary step. It's the closest we come to being absolutes. We, we talked about how careful scientists can be, but uh, I suppose one of the most decisive things we do is to name a species and then put our name after it. Welcome the future to prove us wrong. Yeah, and names are also uh, powerful as well. Like, I've never named a species, but both of you have. How do you come up with the name that you give a species? I don't have a child, but I envision that it's very similar to when you're first naming your child. You have to look at it really closely and you cradle it and you say how beautiful it is and you want to pick a name that really captures its essence. It's going to be with it for the rest of its life. Does it have to do something about the place that it came from? Was there someone really important that you want to honor? Is it something about how it looks? 
or is it sort of a feeling or emotion that you want to capture? So my first one species was Eurothenes plasticus. So plasticus was the species name that we gave it. And that came from discovering that one of the 11 specimens that we had had a microfiber really similar to PET, which is the main polymer in plastic water bottles. And what was, I guess, crazy about this species is that before we knew about it, it knew us. And so by naming it Plasticus, gave a symbol for the pervasiveness of marine plastic pollution. So that seemed like a really fitting name for that species. Other than sort of helping us to separate out separate species and to place them, what are some of the other things we can learn from genetic analysis? You know, we've spoken about using these barcodes of only looking at a sentence at a time and comparing them across species. What we can also do is we can then look at more so we can say right actually we want to look at the whole thing or a really really large chunk of the genome like all this data and we can compare these to species that we know are similarly related and we can also compare them to species that aren't so one thing we could do is we know that we have these amphipods in particular that live at the very, very bottom of the sea. They're the deepest living invertebrate species. But amphipods are incredible. They're found really just about anywhere. They're found at any depths in the ocean. They're found at the intertidal. So if you've ever been rock pooling and you pull up a rock and there's a little squiggly thing moving around, good chance it's an amphipod. They're found in freshwater. They're found in rivers. So they have this really unique ability to have had all these adaptations that have allowed them to live just pretty much anywhere. So we can compare sort of shallow amphipods to deep amphipods and look which genes are similar, which genes have changes in them. And that can give us some idea about how these animals can survive at really deep levels with all this hydrostatic pressure. We can start to pick apart all of the bits that are really, really interesting. Um, and that, again, helps us understand sort of the extremes of life um, and how things have become adapted to the deep sea. And we can also look at things like we know that there are populations of amphipods in different trenches. So I think all three of us have done a lot of work on hadal trenches. Lots of them are quite far apart in terms of distance. You know, we weren't really sure how animals moved between them, if they could move between them, because it's also very difficult to observe in the deep sea. So we can't just sit around and follow an amphipod. So using molecular tools, so looking at genetics, we can actually see whether there's connectivity between them, whether individuals move between populations or whether they're isolated in maybe one trench or maybe just one or two trenches. And that can be really important for things like protecting areas. So if you have an area where maybe one trench and there's a whole bunch of, of species that live there and they don't live anywhere else, so they've, they've become so specially adapted to this one place and they've not had any mixing with any other populations, if that area that trench was to become destroyed in some way you would lose all of the species that live there there would be no recovering so that's really important for us to know and it gives us an idea of how fragile the populations can be or how resilient resilient to, to changes if they have lots of populations that can feed into each other and one of the emergent technologies now is environmental dna so looking for things without even actually finding them just looking for their DNA in the environment. Yeah, and it, that's a really useful tool because you don't have to try and capture everything because the idea behind the eDNA is that everything sort of sheds bits of itself, like scales come off and... Mucus and poop. All the secretions, um, and you should be able to pick them up. But when you do that, you you just sort of say, I, I want to look at that, that one sentence and I want to look at it for everything that's in this water. That's where you then really need to rely on having a good database to match to. Because if you don't have a good database, you could have a, a whole bunch of sequences and you could say, oh, wow, in this area, we've identified 50 different species. But if you don't have a database that's attached to a physical specimen, that's not going to be that much help to you. It's just, oh, yeah, I found it here and someone sequenced it over there but we still don't know what it is. It could be a microbe, it could be a fish. I mean, we could usually detect at least the difference between a microbe and a fish, um, <laughs> but maybe not necessarily to something like species level. 
the past couple of years, it's become quite popular. So it's becoming more refined and we're sort of understanding more about the limits of it, but also the utilities of it as well. So I think that's going to be something we're going to continue to see a lot of in the coming years is eDNA. Samples. Confidence is building, isn't it? I, I remember when it sort of first emerged, it was quite prone to error and there was a lot of refinement we needed of the method, but it sounds like some, some really incredible things are being done with it now. Yeah, but that's the same for any developing emerging yeah. technique you know nothing ever appears to you perfectly but yeah it's it's really developed over the past couple of years we worry about sampling bias a lot in the deep sea like a lot of our equipment is baited and we're only going to capture species that respond to bait there's bound to be things we're missing and there are some particular issues to sampling like specific to deep sea isn't it i, I remember we worked very hard to process samples as quickly as possible. And you had a really tough time sequencing them, didn't you, Heather? And, and pioneered some new methods. Yeah. So one of the main problems with trying to get good quality genetic samples is, as Joanna explained, when we do extractions, when we want to take the DNA out of the cells, we want to break the cells and we want to wash away everything we don't want and we just want to be left with our DNA. But when you do that, you're exposing the DNA to a not so hospitable environment. When it's in the cell, it's very, very happy. It's just doing its own little thing. It's replicating nicely. It's not bothered by anything. But when you take it out of the cell, it can become degraded, which just means that it starts breaking apart. When you first take it out of the cell, it will degrade a little bit. And over time, it just continues to degrade, which is why when we do these extractions, we then have to store them usually long term in freezers to try and slow down that degradation process. With the pressure change from taking samples from the deep sea up to the surface, what actually happens is a lot of the cells explode because of the, the change in pressure. So by the time we receive the samples on the surface, they've already had a lot of damage to the cells, which means that the DNA is already mostly floating around and beginning to break down quite quickly. And that also isn't helped by that most of the sampling happens in warm climates, which also helps to break it down. So whenever we get samples on deck, we really have to process them really really as quickly as we can I've had to come up with a bunch of sort of nifty ways to get around things and I know that Joanna has also developed a whole bunch of protocols specific to samples that were stored in ethanol as well because the ethanol does help to stop the degradation but generally that's more helpful if you have samples where there hasn't been cells that have already been broken down so for the deep sea really if you want to do genetic stuff you want frozen samples. It's just something that it is an extra level of something that we need to consider or we need to tailor our expectations of what we can get out of it. Dr. Johanna Weston, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I will be, uh, I'll be watching your career with great interest. And that was a pressurized version of one of our longer episodes. If you enjoyed that and you would like to hear the full length episode, just match the episode numbers and you'll be able to find the full length version in the feed. Thanks for listening. We'll deep see you next time. And I abyss you already.